Everybody read together with me. Jesus went up to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish festivals. Now there is in Jerusalem near the Sheep Gate a pool which, which in Aramaic is called Bethesda and which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. Here a great number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, the paralyzed. One who was there had been invalid for 38 years. Okay, we'll just pause right there. But actually, the, do you see chapter, uh, verse 4 kind of disappeared? Okay, uh, verse 4 actually in IV is a little footnote. Somebody added this in here, and so that's why it's not found in NIV. But if you go to another version like NASB or King James Version, you're going to see this. And then they'll tell you that verse 4 says, waiting, these people are waiting for the moving of the waters or stirring of the waters. For an angel of the Lord went down at certain seasons into the pool and stirred up the water. Whoever then first, after the stirring of the water, stepped in was made well from whatever disease with which he was afflicted okay so here you have a tradition you have a tradition that tells you there is a pool whenever the angel of the Lord came and stir up the water maybe it's, it's like a whirlpool you see a whirlpool taking place I mean that's my imagination and an, an invisible hand that will be stirring the water and then as soon as the stirring begin uh, you, these people, these sick people will be rushing down to to get into the water. Whoever gets in there first gets healed. Okay? Now that's not necessarily a biblical thought but that was a tradition. People believed in that and that's why a lot of people gathered, congregated in those areas. Could you imagine this place called Bethesda? And the word Bethesda means a place of mercy. Okay, a place of mercy. So these people congregate in a place of mercy and, uh, and, and they're expecting whenever the hand of angels come and stir up the water, they'll be rushing down the stampede, I don't know, <laughs> just rushing down, get into the water, whoever gets in there first the first place gets the first place price, which is healing. Healing. What, what, isn't that glorious? Pardon me? That which is not permanent. Uh, I'm sorry, it's not permanent. Uh, so, no, but they didn't know that. They, they didn't know that. They just know that they're going to get healed. All right? But, but now you do because I, I am so generous and I share that information with you guys. So you know not all healing is permanent. So, yes? How about the blind? It's not permanent because you're going to die and you can do <laughs> For, forever singing no okay man. come on <laughs> in the grave <laughs> eyes open <laughs> but anyways <laughs> okay so I, I want you to think about every society we have a place for these these people that are are not quite what we consider the normal people Okay, and, and not just abnormal or, or people that are, that are just, that, that not just unusual, but, but these people are somewhat unwanted by the society. And, and let me clarify what that is. Uh, see, the, the Jews look at the infirmed, the, the sick, and, and how do they regard them? They regard them sinful and unclean. Do you understand this? See, when you're born... Uh, a cripple. If you're born a cripple, what do you? Th what is their interpretation of your condition? That either your parents sin or you sin. That's why you're in this condition. Are you with me? That's how their society looked at all these infirm people, sick people. All right. So, so for all these people to gather over there, do you think this is a frequent visit? Like. You know, this is the area of Jerusalem. Everybody loves to go visit and say, hey, hey, all these sinful people over there on the right and all the broken arms ones over there on the left. You know, are, are you knowing, understanding what I'm saying? Okay, this is not a place where people want to go. This place called uh, Bethesda is not a common place for, for people to visit. Um, and, and I think uh, you, you guys kind of getting a drift when I'm talking about every society, every city, uh, if it's large enough, we have places where we put people that, that are not really wanted in the society. Okay? They're not really wanted. And, and to extend that you can call them trash. Trash. Now that, that's crude when I call them trash, because, but that's how we do treat them. You know? 
And in, 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 in Manila, they have some really nice uh, development. Some city uh, like Makati is just very, very modern, uh, first rate architecture. Uh, it's, it's like New York, Manhattan, and uh, maybe Singapore or uh, Los Angeles. Some of the really nice uh, buildings. Uh, and, and there, in, in that area, you're not going to see the homeless. You're not going to see the poor because they don't expect them there. Okay? They expect these people somewhere else. Okay? All right. And uh, she's talking about Cerritos. Let's bring it back home a little more. Okay? In the city of Cerritos, do you have ghettos like that? Do you have places where there are homeless people, uh, the sick and infirmed? No, no. There, we don't have any shelters. You know why? Because whenever a cop or uh, L.A. Sheriff's Department folks that drive through and see a homeless, a vagrant, or someone who just uh, want to sleep on the floor, they will pick them up and move them to Lakewood or Long Beach. That's what they'll do. That's what they'll do. Okay? We move the unwanted people somewhere else. And, and then that's why when we go to L.A., uh, for the most part, you, you, you see a decent, nice city, but then when you go to Skid Row, what happens? That's where all the, all the unwanted people congregate in places like that. Just kind of imagine this is how, and this is how our world today, we're, we're 21st century mindset, and we're, we're treating people this way, okay? Uh, now, we don't know how they end up where they are, but we just know that we're better than they are, somehow. And they're, they're put away, uh, out of sight, out of mind, out of sight, out of mind. So we don't have to think about that, because you don't want to see them right out of your target. Um, you don't want to see them right out of the supermarket. You don't want to see them in the malls. You know, you don't, because they're just, they, they, they just make you uncomfortable. They do make you uncomfortable. They remind you of certain things about life that, that just not very pleasant, because bad things happen. Okay? Bad things happen. We don't know. We don't want to ask the question, but people do get informed. People do get sick. And, and often, some people don't want to go to hospital, because it makes them upset, because that they have to deal with the reality of sickness and death. Some people don't like to go visit a hospital. But so, so here you have, you have a, a society that has a particular place called the, the place of mercy. And then there they have, uh, I, I don't know who came up with the story about the stirring of the water. Kind of encourage everybody to gather in that area, isn't it? Okay, it, it's, it's very convenient. Too convenient to come up with a story that about the stirring of the water so people get healed there. So, so therefore these people will gather around those areas. And the field packed with these people. And, and you think about the infirm people. I mean, the, the people that, are, uh, that have they've been lamed all their life, are they able to get into the pool? No, they have to crawl. In and so, so whoever is not really sick will get in there first. So, so let's say if I had a little skin rash, okay, and the stirring water began, guess who's the one who's most capable of getting up and getting in there first? Me! Me, I just got a little rash. Yeah, I beat everybody. That person who's crippled, that person has got some issue with their back, they're not going to get in there. Why? Because I am faster. So the healthier people will get healed first. Doesn't that make sense? All right? Does that make sense? Okay, well, that's how it is with, with this tradition. I mean, look at our society. Sometimes we create systems that actually help the people that really don't need the help the most. Come on, somebody say amen. Some of you socialists out there, come on, say amen really loud. <laughs> okay, think about it. <laughs> you guys all left. <laughs> Actually, you're right to me, but you're left uh, to yourself. But anyway. So, yes, every society we have scenes that uh, we don't want to see. Uh, but you notice something. Jesus came to Jerusalem at a time of festival. Uh, guess what? This festival is equivalent to what? Party. Party. There's a lot of eating, dancing, celebration going on. Okay? Uh, of course, there's religious celebration, but nonetheless, a lot of people never get a chance to eat meat. This is for the first time. Every, every year, they get to eat meat. Okay? It's a good time. I, that just reminds me of in the Philippines when I was a Sarangani. All these people ate rice, and they ate a lot of rice. <laughs> little kid, little, this little kid, this amount of rice. Wow. <laughs> he just ate rice. Nothing else. Nothing else. I mean, I could just imagine in, in those days, uh, in, in Jesus' time, and people just 
ate their staple food and they don't really necessarily have meat on a regular basis. So once a year due to, sac due to sacrifice, uh, they, they get to have some meat. And, and this, you know, little boy, they didn't... And then the adults actually get a little piece of chicken. They really get a little piece of chicken. Not, that's already a tremendous benefit for these people already. Tremendous benefit because uh, they're just poor. These aren't done. So, but it's interesting how Jesus, amidst of this festive atmosphere in a, a great city, he end up in in the place where nobody want to go. Okay, places people don't want to visit. Jesus end up being there. Now, I want to tell you something about Jesus. He goes places where nobody else wants to go. Somebody say amen. I love Jesus for that. I, I love Jesus because with stuff that people don't want to deal with, Jesus deals with. It, it just amazes me how, how he just, he is so beautiful for that. He loves people. And so he ended up in this place called Bethesda and, uh, and, and started looking at these people. You know, there's uh, um, no sense of avoidance in, in his uh, vocabulary. I mean, he doesn't want to avoid anybody. I mean, even this person, I think he's a total jerk, but Jesus still like this guy. I'll, I'll tell you why he's a jerk. All right. So anyway, let's move on to verse 5 and 6. Can we read 5 and 6 together? One who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, do you want to get well? Now, if you've been an invalid, it means that you cannot walk for 38 years. Okay? To us, those of us who can walk, this question may seem kind of cruel. Do you want to get well? <sighs> who wouldn't? Who wouldn't want to get well? Do you understand? It's like a no-brainer. Why are you asking the dumbest question here? Don't you think I'm sick? And, and don't you realize that I, I'm not able to walk? And I can't, don't you look, you know, can't you tell? Why do you need to ask the question? And I, I, I think it's, it, it's something that uh, we, we really need to think about today, actually, because I, I want to ask this question. Now, if you've been an invalid, um, you, you haven't been able to walk for 38 years. For some of you, that would have been a whole lifetime or double your lifetime, okay? But some, but some of you, 38 years is a long time, okay? I don't know what's the average age of people uh, of uh, the life of their, uh, you know, expectancy uh, in, in Jesus' time. But uh, today we went 75, 80, is that right? Or higher maybe, life expectancy. But, but... 40, almost 40 years is at least half a lifetime. You, you've been in this condition for most of your life, 38 some years, all right? You've developed this condition over time, and, and you've been in that condition for so long, all right? Why would you want to change? The question I want to ask you is, do you want to change? Do you want to change? Because you guys understand, every healing is not permanent. Every healing is not permanent. Therefore, do you want to change? You know, we, we all know that uh, our health is directly connected to our lifestyle. You know that, right? For example, I have a heart condition. I just had a heart surgery a year ago, all right? And some of you say, Pastor James, you must know that by now you must change your diet. You got to eat differently. You can't be eating fatty food, no fried stuff, no more french fries, not all the good stuff, no more ribs. You got to understand that. That must be true, right? You guys all know that. And, and as a diabetic, you know, as a pastor who's a diabetic, you, you know, must know that. No sweet, sugary drinks, you know. No uh, carbohydrate, not a whole lot of rice. So I was in Sarangani, I really struggled because that's all they had was rice. And uh, yeah, <laughs> in Estancia it was a lot better because they have a lot of fish. Fish was good, I um, ate a lot of fish. But what in the condition you're in, what would you change? What are you willing to change? Because your values dictate your behavior. Your behavior kind of dictate your decisions. 
your decisions and, and it creates habits that you have and your habit creates certain lifestyle because we all know that if you got a heart condition and you got a heart disease and just because you got healed and you still continue to eat fatty food eat all the adobo that you wanted and all kinds of uh, uh, fried chicken whenever you feel like you know and what's gonna happen you're gonna end up in the same place aren't you are you with me okay okay so so we have certain values certain habits and, and, and the certain choices that we make that have to go so the question is do you really want to change just because you get healed doesn't mean it's permanent are you with me all right doesn't because you must realize our, our lifestyle our condition sometimes is a choice do you want to change and so so when Jesus came up to this person who's 38 years in this condition of, of not being able to walk lying on this mat and then Jesus asked this question do you want to change I, I think it's a very valid question not an invalid question Just anyway it's a it's a valid question because it, it is valid for you and me right now even now even now right now some of you don't know don't really know the question some of you don't understand the question because my question to you do you want to be healed is not as simple as that it's a little more than that are you ready for change some of us have habits that we established for over 30 years 20 years 10 years we have certain principles that we hold that's causing us to be in this condition we're in see we are where we are today are those decisions those choices the values and the principles how we live our lives that led us to where we are today are you with me so far everybody amen you know what I'm at? are you ready for a change you may not be an invalid but you got some problems you got some issues are you ready for a change and the question is that it's so obvious a lot of people don't understand don't understand that I want to be healed I want to be healed but you don't want to change your lifestyle you don't want to change your habits you don't want to change your choices I want to be healed heal from what heal from what because every healing is temporary it's, it's not permanent okay what are you waiting for some people want God to heal them and just bring them in a state of health in this in a position of freedom but then they don't want to live a life that maintains that health and freedom what kind of choices do you give God what choice do you give God and, and Jesus is asking you do you want to change do you really want to change because frankly if I had if I've been in a condition for 38 years I may get used to that condition I say you know what I'm comfortable even though everybody look at me and say man how can that be comfortable but I tell you even though this place has been 40 30 years eight years but there are still comfortable spots that makes me happy there's a little little spot that's kind of a little soft you know there are cushy spots on this on this mat even though everything is crusty and falling apart but they're still comfortable spots you may look at me as an invalid but I you know what I still get a little kick every now and then and say this is pretty good I tell you you may not like it but I like it are you with me just because you think I'm 38 years in an invalid position but I tell you people may not want to change it's from the world's perspective from the world outside because I somehow need to rationalize how I live my life are you with me I need to rational my, rationalize my life so I can be in this condition all these years. How do you think I survive all this time? If I th think of myself as invalid for 38 years, I would have killed myself by now. So I had to think myself differently. See? Different perspective. 38 years is a lifetime. Lifetime of value, choices, habit, and condition. What do you eat? What do you do? Do you exercise? Do you sleep? Basic things, basic questions. Now, let's look at this person's response. Verse 7. All right. Sir, come on, everybody. Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. While I am trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. Okay. I, I want to give this person credit 
for trying. Somebody say, come on. Good job, trying. Come on. And, 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 then, that, and then that's all I'm going to give them. Okay? That's all I'm going to give them for trying. That, that's it. Okay? But for, because for 30 darn years, 38 years, all right, I can't believe if a person know they have a solution to their problem, even though it could be superstition, okay, even though it could be superstition. He knew that this, this solution for his problem for 38 years, he never found some friend, some friends to stay with him for a week and say, you know what, can you commit to be here with me and walk me down there and fight everybody off for me, okay? Tackle whoever was trying to get in there and just make sure I'm the first one to get in there, okay? See, the problem with this guy is after 38 years, he's still making excuses for himself. Look at this. He said, no one is there to help me out. Come on. And you can just see the, the, the tears coming out and the, and the victim kind of, a, kind of life uh, mentality and then that kind of spirit coming out. I'm a victim, Jesus. Look at me. 38 years. And every time I want to go in there, somebody else get in there before me. Oh, I'm always second to the last. Could you just imagine this person pretty pathetic in this condition? Sad. After 38 years, he believed something that could save his life, that could change his condition. Yet, he's never found a way. I can't it's because somebody didn't do this. Somebody else didn't do this. The condition wasn't perfect for me to get in there. And I, and I just, I tried and I tried and I tried. I could never get out. You know what? That's how it is with a lot of people. They complain about life and they're just a victim of their own making because they don't try. Could you imagine a person that's in that condition for the 38 years, doesn't have any friends or family? Why? Why is it that he's there alone? Why is he there not, not helped by another person? Why is it? Is it because that his personality is as irresponsible as he is described? We're, we're, we're seeing the description here. Maybe he's being a little dis irresponsible. See, see, every time, so, you know, let's, every time I have a problem with Jeremy, okay? Let's say we have Jeremy and I, we have a problem. And, and it could be Jeremy's problem, right? And, and Trisha and I could, could have a problem, right? But if I have a problem with everybody, guess who the problem is? Hello? Hello? It's me. I may have a problem. Do you guys, see, you might, have, you might have to own up to your own problem and say, maybe the problem is me. Maybe I am just an irresponsible person who doesn't, doesn't care enough about other people and therefore nobody is around. See, when you're in that situation for 80, 38 years, I want you to remember what Pastor James said this morning. If you're in that position for 38 years and you say, you know, nobody comes to visit me in the hospital. I can't do anything, you know. You know what? If you have no friends coming visiting you, nobody taking care of you, do you remember what I said? Okay? Maybe, maybe because you're just difficult. You're just difficult to work with. Okay? And I, I know it's, it's, it's uh, for the Jews, you know, touching, the, touching someone like that is... is it's, unclean. I, I, I know, but don't you have people willing to risk their life for you? You should. I think everyone should. Everyone should have people visiting them in the hospital. Come with us home. I, I think everybody should. The success of your life has to do with how, how many people actually care about you. Somebody say amen. And, and I know some people that are so, so, so poor. All they have is money so poor. You know what I'm talking about? All they have is money. They use, try to use money to control everybody, but then when they're old and dying, nobody wants to care about them. Nobody cares. And here you got a, a, a person who is an invalid for 38 years. It goes back to the same question that Jesus asked earlier. Do you want to get well? Do you want to change? Do you want to get better? Alright? So, now, now here, here's the healing part of the story. It, it's very exciting, all right? Everybody should pay attention now. Just, okay, verse 8 and verse 9, all right? So, then Jesus said to them, him, get up, pick up your mat, and walk. At once the man was cured. He picked up his mat and walked. All right, wonderful story of healing. First of all, Jesus asked, asked this man to stand up. Okay? 
Now, if you didn't have the will to stand up, would you be able to stand up? I don't think so. I think every healing takes at least two components. One is God's will, and another part is your willingness to cooperate with God. Okay? Because a lot of people pray a prayer expecting people God to lift them up. God, lift me up from my condition. So, so God is going to lift them up. And even if you had your legs crawled up like this, you know, God's going to straighten out your leg, pushing it down. And then, and you, you know, your foot is kind of twisted. He's going to soften it, massage you for you. Come on! Make an effort! You understand? See, when God says to stand up, this person must say, yeah, even though I never stood for 38 years, I'm going to stand up. So I got to give him credit for trying. Do you understand? See, without trying, this person would still be lying there. Jesus said, stand up. No, I'm an invalid. Are you stupid? <laughs> Can you not tell? I've been in this condition for 88 years. Jesus, you, don't you understand? Okay, are you dumb? You know, like, hey, that's how we treat God sometimes. See, don't you know uh, this is my condition? Yeah, of course, Jesus is understanding the condition, but you know what? Whenever God says he's, He wants you to stand up, you have to cooperate with Him. You've got to work with Him. But see, a lot of people don't understand that they have to cooperate with God. They think it's all God. Yes, it's all God. But when God's lifting you up, straighten out your leg. Straighten out your leg. So He stood up. I give Him credit for that. This guy tried. Okay? What an amazing thing. After 30 darn years, and now he is standing up. And Jesus gave him another command. said, you know what? Pick up your mat. Why do you have to pick up your, your, your mat? What's the point? Well, it is your mat, first of all. You may think it's comfortable for 38 years because it's a little more comfortable than the hard floor that other people's lying on, but at least you have a mat. And that mat, even though in your eyes and the, world's, and the eyes of the rest of the world, it could be trash, stinky, bed bugs, germs galore. Are you with me? Are you with me? All right. It could smell so, so because look, he can't get up and pee and poop. Just imagine. Just. All right. Somebody had to help clean him up, right? Somebody had to help clean him up. All right, so, so just imagine that little mat that he's been on for 30 years because he, I don't think he has the money to buy another mat. And, and that, so he's been on that for a long time and people move him around with that thing. And, and, and I've seen people like that in China and the Philippines and uh, just, uh, they, they reek. They don't smell very good. And, and to the rest of us, that's trash. But you know what? It's been comfortable on that thing for 38 years. Eight years, okay. So, what what is what is Jesus saying to him? You know, Jesus saying, "Hey, pick up your own mess." All right. You may be lying in your mess and comfortable in it for a long time, but I want you to pick up your mess and walk out of it. I don't want you to leave it here for somebody else to clean up, like McDonald's. I want you to pick it up right now, get out of here. And, and as he was walking out of here, and he encountered some people, and that, and. Okay, and this is what happened. All right, verse uh, toward the uh, second half of verse nine, and let's read to eleven. So that day, the day on which this took place was Sabbath, and so the Jewish leaders said to the man who had been healed, "It is a Sabbath; the, the law forbids you to carry your mat." But he replied, "The man who made me well said to me, 'Pick up your mat and walk.'" Do you not understand what's going on here and you, you see something odd in this passage? Or as, as you, 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 you know, you're not getting this. Okay, reading this passage, don't you feel odd? Nobody questioning say, Wow, you, you used to be an invalid, now you're walking. You know, that, that should be the first thing, right? But instead, they're saying, Hey, you're holding him mad. What's up with that? This is Sabbath. You're not supposed to carry things and work. Are you with me? Kind of weird. All right. Now, our society is kind of like that too. Our world is kind of like that. You know, a lot of times we care about so much about the, the law. Okay? We care.
care about the law, what do we care about? We care about theology, we care about responsibility. Who's right, who's wrong, who's responsible for this? Who told you to do this? And this person said, it was Jesus. And, and, I, I, and I noticed in this story that you didn't, you didn't see this person standing up and jumping up and down and saying, praise the Lord Jesus, thank you, I can walk now. You didn't see that. Why? Why? Because he's irresponsible. See, when people come up to him and say, Who, what's going on? How come you're carrying a mat on a Sabbath day? You're not supposed to do that. He says, uh, the person told me to do it. Um, why are you doing this? Oh, my mom told me to. Um, why are you this way? Uh, my teacher says this is what it was supposed to do. Um, and uh, my mentor said this. You know, like my pastor said this. You know, it's always somebody else's responsibility. Are you with me? We're not willing to take on responsibility ourselves. And when a society, all we care about is laws and rules and, and regulations. All we care about who's right and who's wrong, who's responsible. And you end up with the people. That's all they care about is who's responsible. And that's it. You know, we're in a stinky condition. Why? Because of Obama. We're in this stinking condition because of all the racist people out there. You know, like, what? Couldn't you own up to some of the problems here? Do you understand? Can we own up to some of the problems we have here today? You know, pick up your own mess for change, right? Say, that's your own problem. Pick it up. So, you know, like, some people, uh, they, they just live, go through life blaming people or putting responsibility on others. You know, I, I know it is, it is true what he said. Jesus told him to do it, and he did it. Okay, he did it. But you know, instead of giving glorified, uh, glory to God and being thankful for, for what he's done after lying there for 38 years, now he's walking, it's a, which is the most amazing thing going on, and he's still, somebody told me to walk and give up, pick up my mat. And, and that's what I'm doing. And do, do you see how absurd the story is? Okay, this is very absurd. Okay, so let's move on because the story gets better. All right, so they, uh, so they, verse 12 says, verse 12 and 13. So they asked him, who is this fellow who told you to pick it up and walk? The man who was healed had no idea who it was, so Jesus had slipped away into the crowd that was there. And this I want to remind you once again, you know, all they cared about was the law, uh, the tradition, and, and who's right and who's wrong, who's responsible. Nobody noticed that this person is healed. Do you realize that most people don't care about people's life? Nobody cares. Most people don't care. You know? Oh, you got a cold. You're sick. You're not doing well. You're not happy. You're lonely. A lot of people don't care. The truth is, a lot of people don't care about that. All they care about is, oh, did you get a good grade? Did you get a report card? <laughs> did, you get, did you get this? Did you get that? Oh, did you perform well? Did you make a lot of money? How you doing? Are you okay? Are you happy? Are you right or wrong? That's what people care about. You know, that's a lot of times that's what people care about. And that's how the world is. And people think about responsibility. Nobody cared whether or not this person was healed. He was sick. All right, let's go to verse 14 and 15. Let's wrap it up, okay? Ready? Later Jesus found him at the temple and said to him, See, you are well again. Stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. The man went away and told the Jewish leaders that it was Jesus who had made him well. Okay, follow the story real quick. Follow, follow the story. This man started walking, pick up the mat, he's going around, and people start pointing out what's wrong with him. Okay, why are you walking with the mat? That is illegal. Don't do that. Okay? And uh, you see, see, you really notice that Jesus responds to this man. Why do you think he was sick in the first place? Do you get the hint from the story? What is the story? What, what is it saying? What did Jesus say to him? Stop sinning or else you'll get worse. Stop sinning. So what happened? What was the real problem? The problem was sin problem. See, most people don't realize that sin can bring about illnesses. Illnesses. Illnesses not only in a physical sense, but in an emotional, spiritual sense. 
say, what kind of sin do you think this person has? Well, I don't know precisely what kind of sin he has, but I, I can guess him a hint. Okay? Based on the story, we know what? That he's living an irresponsible life. Everything is somebody else's fault. Come on, somebody say amen. Everything is somebody else's fault. Therefore, can this person be responsible for his own condition? Obviously not. It's always somebody else's fault. So, Jesus telling him, stop sinning or something else, something worse may happen to you. And, uh, and this person never asked to be saved. Salvation-wise. Are you, do you follow the story? Jesus ne never had this discussion about salvation with him. Because he never, how can I have a better life? No, he's never concerned about that. He's more concerned about, okay. Now that I can walk, so what? See, there are people who can walk and they're still invalid. Are you with me? Some people who are invalid because they cannot walk. Other people, they are invalid even though they can walk. Some people have their full faculty working, but they're invalid. Why? Because they have no purpose, no direction, no reason for living. They don't know why they're living. And when you have the source of life right in front of you, Jesus, the source of life. Jesus is God, and He is the person who can offer you life. Right in front of your eyes, and you're not seeking life from Him. There is something wrong. This person is invalid, even though he can walk. Spiritually. In just I don't I don't understand this person not that way because I I, I only know that uh, he doesn't care too much and, and you notice that, well, what, what, you know why I say all this is because what verse 15 says okay see the man went away and told the Jewish leader that it was Jesus who had made the more because he's he's in trouble right now see he's got a parking ticket for carrying the map. He's got a parking ticket, and then, and then he's going to say, you know, who, who, who made me walk with a map? Jesus. Did he have to do that? No. So now he points the finger right back at Jesus and says, Jesus is the one who made me break the law of the Jews. I'm not responsible. He's not grateful. Do you understand? A person who is not grateful for the work of God, and all he cared about is taking responsibility, put it right back on Jesus and say, you are the one who caused me to sin against the, the Jewish law and therefore I'm not going to be responsible. I'm going to blame Jesus. All right, do you see the story? Do you, why I think this guy's a jerk? Jesus healed him from his infirmity for 38 years and yet he walked around and, and he, he throws the responsibility back at Jesus and, and that's why his life was never, never saved. I don't think he's saved. Why? He's irresponsible. Never took responsibility for his own life. You know, I, I was uh, in Manila talking to some friends of mine, and uh, we were talking about this church that they're in, and this church talk had a lot of problems, a lot of problems. It was describing this one guy that goes into their church, steal all their toilet paper. Steal their toilet paper. Why? Why? And they offer to give him toilet paper, and he still steals toilet paper from them. And then to me, we're just a lot of really stupid, ridiculous, demonic things, okay? Really dumb things. And I, after I hear all this stuff, and I, you know, I just have to ask yeah, because I already know the answer. I said, you know, your church is in Manila, and you're right in the red light district. And you know what red light district is? It's where you have um, just uh, people, the, the brothel of a city, you know, where there's a lot of illegal activity, the drug lords are there and so forth. Uh, I, I already know. They, they're not doing anything. As a church, they're not doing anything about their, their community. Okay? They're not doing anything about their community. So what? Well, so whenever you don't do anything about a filthy community, guess what happens to the filth? They come into the house. I mean, just imagine this. Could you imagine if your house, outside of your house, everything is full of garbage? Trash. Garbage. Okay? And all you care about is your own garbage. But when you leave your house, whenever you go outside, what do you smell? You smell garbage, right? Trash. Why? 
because you never took ownership, took responsibility for your community. See, when a church do not, a church does not take the responsibility for its community, guess what happened? The filth of the community comes into the church. You're going to see a lot of garbage coming in here. Why? Because you're not taking care of it. Why? Simple. We need to take responsibility. So, I basically say, you know what? You guys need to start thinking about what to do with your community. Where there is trash and garbage, what do you think you see? A lot of lives. Lives. And whenever you see a lot of demonic things going on, you know there's a lot of garbage going on. Garbage. And so, that's why we need to clean out. Clean house. So, um, the, church, the church of Jesus Christ need to work on taking trash out. Tell the person next to you and say, take your trash out. Take your trash out. Clean up your own mess first, and then start cleaning up the messes around this neighborhood. Come on. Are you with me? All right. Uh, we have, next time we'll probably bring the homeless in. <laughs> they talked about that the first meeting, I think. But the second meeting, they decided to focus on the community. Okay. So that is a community event that we're actually doing on the 18th. And we also have uh, Trunk or Treat. Trunk or Treat coming up on the, what's the date? 31st. Uh, we're going to have Trunk or Treat. How many of you have been to a Trunk or Treat? Or a Trunk or Treat? Okay. Trunk or Treat basically is... Uh, just you get a drive in with your car and you decorate your trunk and you decorate your trunk and we're going to give out candies from our trunk and last time we did this about two years ago we had about a hundred I think a hundred neighborhood kids that went through our trunks okay they don't have to come to your church but they can go to your trunk okay <laughs> but what is it yeah we invited the schools to come so it, it was it was a lot of fun having all these kids all dressed up and they're they're, they're doing trunk or treat, okay? Instead of trick or treat, we're doing trunk or treat. So, so if you want to sign up, there's a sign up sheet for for this event, and we need eight, 16. We need six more cards. Whoever, uh, did you sign me up already? Okay, we need six more cards. Anyway, anyways, if you have a car, you want to decorate your car, we can help you with a trunk full of candy. All right. So, guys, remember we're a community. And uh, in this community, we care about this community outside of us. All right? Amen? Amen. So let's clean up our own mess. All right? Encourage each other to clean up our own mess. All right? Turn to the person next to you and say, clean up your mess. <laughs>